The Mount of Olives overlooks one of the most magnificent and most sacred cities in the world. This mount is one of three hills on a long ridge to the east of Jerusalem. It's one of the most revered places for Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike. It rises more than 800 meters and offers a spectacular view of the old wall city of Jerusalem. This hill, also called Mount Olivet, takes its name from the fact that it was once covered with olive trees. And one of its most popular and sacred pilgrim sites is an ancient olive grove the Garden of Gethsemane. These old Nile trees have been here since the time of Jesus, and the olive grove holds a significant place in the Bible. One of the most famous meetings of all time took place here. It was a night meeting. Words were spoken. Now, of course, billions of words are spoken every second, but every now and then, Mere words change the shape of our world and alter our lives forever. And that's what happened here. During the course of that conversation, words were spoken that changed the world. Join me as we explore the story of the solitary listener who attended the amazing meeting that happened here. There are many spectacular and glorious mountains in our world. They're famous because of their massive size, impressive peaks and unique shapes. But one of the most famous of all doesn't have any of those features. In fact, it's really only a hill, but it's famous for another reason. Mountains don't get much holier than the Mount of Olives, a sacred site to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Jewish tradition, the Messiah will descend the Mount of Olives on Judgment Day and enter Jerusalem through the Golden Gate in the center of the Eastern Wall of the Temple Mount. For this reason, Jews have always wanted to be buried on the slopes of the Mount. This is the oldest Jewish cemetery in the world. For over 3,000 years, Jews have been buried here. And today, there are over 150,000 graves on the slopes. It's a tradition to place stones on the graves. It shows that someone has visited the grave and that the loved one is not forgotten and that their memory will last for eternity, just like the stones. History tells us that many battles have been fought on this mount. During the siege of Jerusalem, which led to the destruction of the city in AD 70, Roman soldiers from the 10th Legion camped on the mount. From here, they attacked the city and destroyed its beautiful temple. The Mount of Olives is closely associated with Jesus. He spent a lot of time here and he knew this place well. Today, millions of pilgrims come here to follow in his footsteps. Over the centuries, 24 churches were built to commemorate events in Christ's life that happened on the Mount of Olives. Some of the churches are still here today and are popular with the pilgrims. Near the summit of the Mount, they visit the church of Paternoster that celebrates Christ's teaching of the Lord's Prayer. The church features translations of the prayer in 140 languages inscribed on colorful ceramic plaques. Further down the mountain is the church of Dominus Flevet. It's shaped like a teardrop and remembers Christ's tears as he wept over the future fate of Jerusalem. 
Then there's the Church of Mary Magdalene with its seven gilded onion domes. It's one of Jerusalem's most picturesque sites. The church was built in 1888 by Tsar Alexander III of Russia in memory of Mary Magdalene, who found peace and forgiveness in Jesus. Near the foot of the Mount of Olives is the Church of All Nations. It's called this because many countries contributed to the cost of its construction. And it's revered because it's believed to be built over the rock on which Jesus is believed to have prayed in agony the night before he was crucified. The church is situated in the Garden of Gethsemane, a place whose name literally means oil press. A grove of ancient olive trees still stands here today. Jesus often came here. He used the ancient olive grove on the Mount of Olives frequently as a favorite retreat when he needed peace and quiet. And it was here that one of the world's most memorable and important interviews took place. The words that Jesus spoke that night not only dramatically changed the life of the individual that met Jesus here, but they've gone to the ends of the earth and change the destiny of millions of people, and they haven't lost their influence in our world today. The solitary listener who heard the words of Jesus that night was an intellectual who studied at the temple in Jerusalem. His life centered around that sacred site. He was a Pharisee who belonged to the 71-member Sanhedrin, the ruling legal council that was essentially the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. His name, Nicodemus, meant victor over the people. He was a man of learning, a man of wealth and influence. He occupied a very important position in society and everything in his aristocratic background, everything in the beliefs held by his peers, told him not to make this risky visit. Night had settled over the city and most of its inhabitants were in their homes. But this one dignified, prominent priest walked alone in the dark. His destination was a certain quiet spot outside the city, a place where Jesus of Nazareth was known to be. The Sanhedrin was opposed to Jesus and his messianic claims. Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, had always believed that he stood for integrity, for the law of God. But Jesus seemed to be in constant conflict with the Pharisees. Now, if Jesus was a good man, how could this be? This Jesus, after all, had attacked their center of power, the sacred temple in Jerusalem. He had boldly driven out the merchants who provided animals for the sacrifices, as if the temple was his own private domain. Everyone around Nicodemus had come to regard Jesus as an enemy. But Nicodemus had always prided himself as being a fair-minded man, a rational man. So he did a little investigating. He listened. He listened to the people who were claiming Jesus had performed miracles. It was hard to deny that something remarkable was happening. The more he heard, the more Nicodemus felt convicted that fundamentally, Jesus was a good man. These were big questions and posed a terrible dilemma for Nicodemus. Who knows what would have happened to Nicodemus if his colleagues found out that one of their own was so convinced that Jesus was from God that he sought him under the cover of darkness. What Nicodemus couldn't admit to himself was that he feared what his peers might say. He was concerned about his own reputation. It was a bit humiliating for him to be seen talking to this man called Jesus. But he was a troubled man. He had some questions that bothered him. Who should he ask? Where could he find the answers? So Nicodemus walked to the olive grove where Jesus was meditating. 
And here's what Nicodemus said to Jesus, as recorded in John chapter 3 and verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus was asking about the true identity of Jesus. Most Pharisees regarded Jesus as a problem rather than a teacher come from God. Jesus didn't question Nicodemus' motive or rebuke him for coming to visit at night. Jesus frankly made this most famous reply recorded in John chapter 3 and verse 3. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus thought he understood the concept of rebirth. Being a descendant of Abraham was a virtual guarantee of salvation. At this time, they believed that only non-Jews needed to be saved by rebirth into the family of Abraham. So he asked in disbelief in John chapter 3 and verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus knew much better than to take Jesus' words literally. The Jewish priests themselves spoke of Gentile converts as children just born, and they used the same metaphor to describe a bridegroom at his marriage and a king at his enthronement. Nicodemus was growing quite uncomfortable now. After all, he was at the very top of Jewish society, at the very top of religious society, he was accustomed to issuing verdicts and handing out judgments, not receiving pointed advice. But here, this Galilean teacher was telling him he had to be born again, spiritually. He had to start all over again. That was a bit too much to take. Nicodemus was more convicted than perplexed, but he asked skeptically, how can these things be? Jesus earnestly told this Pharisee that he was showing him the way to eternal life. And then he spoke the words that made this meeting so famous and the conversation so important. They're found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. These are the most loved, the most quoted, the most memorized, the most famous words ever spoken. And no wonder, they focus on humanity's biggest issue and give God solution. It's the gospel in a nutshell. It's salvation's formula. It begins with God, it's driven by love, it ends with life. He loves, He gave, we believe, we live. That's it. And so as Nicodemus made his way back down the slope of this mountain toward Jerusalem, he faced a question we all must face. What am I going to do about it? What am I going to do with Jesus? For three years, Nicodemus pondered on this one single encounter with Jesus and wrestled with his decision. To be born again means to start all over again. Believe in Jesus and accept Him as your Saviour. Then to make an inner change with Jesus in your life. Nicodemus faced a choice, an all-important choice. It was a choice between remaining a questioning skeptic and becoming a follower of Jesus. A choice between remaining where he was and entering into that whole new world. To better understand his predicament, Let's take a look at what was happening in Jewish society at this time. The Pharisees and Sadducees, the leaders of Jewish society, decided that Jesus posed a terrible threat. They began to try to discredit Him, and they tried to trick Jesus with their questions. They sent out bright young men, lawyers and scribes, who posed as truth seekers to ask Jesus questions. But they were questions designed to entrap. They tried to catch Jesus saying something that could get him into trouble with the authorities. 
The Jewish leaders were watching Jesus' every move. They had their spies everywhere. They believed they could expose Jesus as an imposter. Now, Nicodemus was part of this world of skepticism. He was a member of their exclusive group. It was all a game, a very serious and deadly game, but a game nevertheless. The questions weren't about getting answers. They were about setting one up, about intellectual arguments and proving who was right. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? If a woman has seven husbands who all die one after the other, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? A lawyer came up one day and asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Yes, lawyers could occupy themselves endlessly on that one. They could carry on very abstract arguments about which principle had priority over another. Jesus, however, summed it up very neatly with a statement from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Yes, that gives meaning to everything in life. But Jesus wanted people to face the truth about themselves. Do you realize that you can try to hide behind the truth? You can use it as a shield, hold it out there in front of you, wield it as a weapon, try to win arguments with it. You can try to score points with it. You can hide behind the truth. Yes, you can hide behind the truth. You can quote it so well that nobody notices that you're not dealing with the real problems inside. You can show off the correct state of mind so that no one notices the painful state of your heart. You can hide behind the truth. It's not enough for you to have the right answers. It's not enough for you to be able to quote God's principles. If it's not touching your heart, and if you're not allowing God into your life, then it's not the truth. Because truth changes a person inside. This is the drama, this is the dilemma that Nicodemus faced. The part of him that was a skeptic wanted to hide behind the truth. But another part of him wanted to take Jesus' words to heart. The proud Pharisee wanted to justify himself, but the honest seeker of truth wanted to be taught. It was a real struggle here on the Mount that night. Nicodemus asked Jesus two questions. How can a man be born again? Jesus told him he must be born of water and the Spirit. Wondering, Nicodemus asked, how can these things be? Jesus explained about the Spirit by using the example of the wind. We cannot see the wind, but we can see the effects of it. We cannot see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the effects of it on people. It lifts people's burdens. It comforts the sorrowing and opens up our hearts to believe in Jesus. Nicodemus heard Jesus' words and he couldn't make those words go away. They kept trying to get down into his heart despite all the mental games he could play. The skeptic was slowly turning into a follower, or at least he was taking definite steps in that direction. We catch a glimpse of this in a certain meeting of the Sanhedrin. They'd been grilling some officials who'd been sent out to bring Jesus in for questioning. The officers had failed to bring arguments against Christ that would be convincing. And the only explanation they could offer was, no man ever spoke like this man. The Sanhedrin rulers were of course very upset, saying in effect, it's only the ignorant crowd that follow this Galilean Jesus. None of us believe in him. And it was at this point, this very moment, that Nicodemus stood up among his peers and said these words recorded in John, the seventh chapter and verse 51. Does our Lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? It was only a question. It may have been only a timid attempt to turn back the tide of prejudice, but Nicodemus had taken a step. He had exposed himself to the scorn of his peers 
the elite of Jerusalem. They immediately shot back at him. Prophets just don't come out of Galilee. Are you also from Galilee? Don't be so ridiculous. Don't be so ignorant. Nicodemus had to do some hard thinking after this. It was becoming more evident that the Sanhedrin were acting out of their jealousy and hatred. They could make their opposition to Jesus sound very pious, but the murderous tone of their voices was certainly identifying their motives. And yet, how could he turn his back on the Sanhedrin? How could Nicodemus turn from them? He'd made it to the top. How could he take the risk of losing everything? Well, at a most unexpected, dark and frightening time, Nicodemus made a choice. The Sanhedrin had sentenced Jesus to death. Jesus the Galilean was dying on a Roman cross. And the friends of Nicodemus were circling that cross, mocking their defeated enemy. They suggested that if he was really such a miracle worker, that he should come down from the cross and save himself. But at that moment, Nicodemus could no longer join them. He'd seen something noble and compassionate in the way he thought of others, the way he forgave and the way that he died. Nicodemus finally looked on this Christ in terms of his own need as a human being. Standing there at the foot of the cross, he realised that pride was just too heavy a burden for him to bear. Always trying to defend yourself was too wearisome a struggle. Always hiding behind the truth was too self-defeating. It was time to let the truth sink into his own heart. You must be born again. And so Nicodemus took the big step. He hurried back into Jerusalem and purchased a mixture of myrrh and aloes, the spices used for embalming. And he came back to the cross bearing these gifts. Another colleague from the Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea, had received permission from Pilate to bury the body of Jesus. And so as the other members of the Sanhedrin watched in shock and amazement, Joseph and Nicodemus gently took Jesus' body down from the cross and they wrapped Jesus in burial clothes along with myrrh and aloes. Then they reverently carried him to Joseph's tomb. And as Nicodemus carried the noblest person he'd ever known, he was sure that pride was too heavy a burden to carry. It was far better to stop trying to be right all the time and to start out as a needy human being at the foot of the cross. The story of Nicodemus, who personally heard the greatest words ever spoken and found hope and happiness on the Mount of Olives, has encouraged and inspired people all over the world. The words that Jesus spoke that night not only dramatically changed the life of Nicodemus, but they've gone to the ends of the earth and changed the destiny of millions of people. And they haven't lost their influence in our world today. If you're struggling with the challenges and stress of everyday life and would like to experience God's unconditional love, if you're looking for ways to live a better life and find inner peace and true happiness, if you'd like to get closer to God, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the Reading Guides, A Second Chance at Life and Bridge to a Satisfying Life. These booklets are our gift to you and are absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gifts we have for you today. Here's the information you need. To request today's free offer, phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 
770-800-0266 in the United States. Or visit our website, tij.tv, or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer, totally free of charge and with no obligation. That's right, you can have today's offer completely free of charge and with absolutely no obligation. You can also write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand, or PO Box 888717, Atlanta, Georgia, 30356, USA, or email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to Jerusalem and the Garden of Gethsemane and our reflections on Nicodemus and the hope and happiness that Jesus can give us, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray for God's leading and guidance in our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, we're tired of playing mental games we're tired of keeping you at arm's length, tired of the arguments. Take away this heavy burden of pride. We need you as our Saviour. We need you as the one who speaks to our hearts. We want to become all that you intend us to be, but we can't do it on our own. We become proud and brittle, just relying on our own strength. So we come to you acknowledging that even in our strength, there is weakness. We accept your gracious forgiveness and love. In the name of Jesus, amen.